Okay. Bon dia. Uh, I will be talking in English, but I speak very good English. So, um, I think I'm the, easily the oldest person here, and I have a personal experience of the weight of history and the way in which history follows us wherever um, we think we are going. And can I just say that when I was a small boy, Britain, Great Britain, ruled India. We had a viceroy of India and ruled that great country. And now Great Britain is ruled by an Indian. And this is an extraordinary example of the way in which history uh, follows you and presents you with totally unexpected uh, um, uh, results. But my talk this morning is going to be about Angola and Mozambique. Um, and uh, since their independence from Portugal in 1975, and how their presence, present situation is firmly rooted in their immediate uh, uh, past. The developmental policies of the later colonial period, for example, the colonnatos, railways, and above all, the dam projects, deeply influenced the long-term thinking of the regimes that took power after independence and helped to explain the gap which was to open up between the populations of the colonies and the revolutionary leadership. This revolutionary leadership was drawn from an intellectual westernized elite, most of whom had been exiles, educated in Lisbon or Paris, and had not been to the country they were going to rule for many years. Even those who had been back to their lands of their birth were not very familiar with the people they aspired to govern, particularly the people of the interior. In Angola, the MPLA leadership was drawn from the Mestizo and Creole families of Luanda. This class had lost status during the years of white immigration, and for them, the party offered a route back to enjoying the status they had been used to in the past and thought of as their right. In Mozambique, the Creole families of Mozambique Island and the vast Zambesian hinterland had lost influence when the capital was moved to Lorenzo Marx in 1898. The Mestizos and the Similados of the new capital had less tradition of local self-government. Even so, the Frelimo leadership largely resembled that of MPLA. Mestizos, whites, and even Goan Indians had a prominent role in the Frelimo uh, central membership. In Mozambique, the situation of the capital in the extreme south of the country meant that the more prosperous and better educated Africans had closer contacts with South Africa than with the remoter areas of their own country. Both Frelimo and MPLA adopted a left-wing ideology. This was partly to attract international allies, but it also played to the interests of the urbanized elites. It was important for them to adopt a non-racial ideology uh, that would endow mestizos, goans, and even whites with the same authenticity as native-born Africans. Both Frelimo and MPLA asserted their right to rule, uh, that their right to rule was based on victory in the independence wars. It was a revolutionary and not a democratic mandate. There were no elections or referenda to establish their legitimacy. But this lack of any popular endorsement would slowly undermine 
the legitimacy of the ruling parties and would deepen the divisions during the civil wars. Later, the holding of regular elections, even though these were manipulated to secure the victory of the ruling parties, was seen as important to maintain the legitimacy of the regimes and their international credibility. At first, both Angola and Mozambique adopted communist-inspired constitutions, Prelimo declaring itself a vanguard party supported by organizations of workers, women, and youth. But these constitutions rapidly became little more than a way of concentrating power in the hands of a narrow party elite. The MPLA successfully established themselves in Angola, initially with the assistance of the departing Portuguese and then with the direct military aid of Cuba. Little attempt was made to implement any leftist policies and the party became wholly concerned with balancing the pressures of their rival international sponsors the Soviet Union and the Cubans. This led in 1977 to the so-called Nito Alves conspiracy and the subsequent purges in which tens of thousands of Angolans were killed and which was to leave an inheritance of factional rivalry in, in the country. In Mozambique, Frelimo rounded up large numbers of its opponents and held show trials. A year after independence, the leading figures who had been opposed to Frelimo were all murdered. It is worth pausing for a moment to consider the ferocious violence of these killings. During the wars of independence, the colonial forces had carried out massacres in Angola and in Mozambique. Um, MPLA and Frelimo had benefited hugely by publicizing these killings. However, the post-independence massacres played differently in a context where widespread African-on-African -African violence was to become a regular feature of African politics, straining the sympathies of many who had supported the independence struggles. This may have encouraged the idea that Africans should be left to conduct their policies in their own way and that they should not be expected to conform to values and ideas that were not African. After 1975, Frelimo had a brief opportunity to pursue socialist policies. Collective farms and cooperatives were established in rural areas and the nationalization of industries and services were inspired by an ideological hostility to traditional authorities and traditional beliefs and customs. Samora Machel's advocacy of the new man, the scientifically minded modern Mozambican, was a striking reinvention in leftist clothing of the colonial Portuguese idea of assimilation. The new man was the close cousin of the old assimilado. Another striking example of co the colonial inheritance being reworked by a newly independent government was the creation of Aldeias Comunais, which concentrated rural populations where they could be supervised and controlled by the government and which adopted the methods and in many cases the actual locations of the colonial period Aldeamentos. By 1980, however, the socialist experiment in Mozambique was overtaken by the outbreak of civil war. Between 1980 and 1990, Angola and Mozambique became victims of the destabilization policies of South Africa. This state of war enabled Frelimo and MPLA to consolidate their position as one party states by delegitimizing any opposition movement. While the South African aggression helped to hide the fact that the civil wars in Angola and Mozambique 
were in part an expression of the hostility of the populations to, to the policies of the ruling elites. All this narrative, uh, although this narrative has been increasingly challenged, both MPLA and Frelimo still cling to the idea that there was never any, any civil war as such, and that UNITA and RENAMO were simply front organizations for South African destabilization. In the case of Mozambique, the ruling party adopts a similar attitude towards the insurgency in the north, which is uh, the present insurgency in the north, which is not considered to have any legitimate internal causes, but to be solely the work of foreign religious extremists. UNITA was led by the charismatic uh, Jonas Savimbi, who depicted MPLA as an urban mestizo elite with no roots among the Angolan people. In Mozambique, Lakama, Afonso Lakama, like Savimbi, was able to exploit traditional culture, traditional beliefs, and attachments to the land. And this enabled him to articulate a whole range of grievances and resentments. Um, in Mozambique in particular, uh, this took the form of a regional um, uh, split in the country. The position of the capital, Maputo, almost as an enclave in South Africa, had isolated it from the rest of the country, while the region north of the Zambezi was almost completely cut off from the south. Regional isolation was also a factor in Angola, regions like Lunda and Moshiko being remote and almost unknown to the elites of the coastal cities. The end of the Soviet Union and the apartheid regime in South Africa coincided with major readjustments to international aid policies. This was, uh, there was a renewed promotion of, of a liberal agenda, both politically with the demand for free elections and multi-party democracy, and economically with the adoption of the ideas of the so-called Washington Consensus. It was in this context that the United Nations became involved in ending the civil wars in Angola and Mozambique. In Angola, negotiations beginning in 1988 led to a ceasefire and to elections which were held in 1992, the first elections since independence. But these took place in a country where two rival armies had not been disbanded and where the elections were perceived as being a zero-sum game with the winner taking all, a formula ill-suited to ending a civil war. The results were rejected by UNITA and the civil war, kept alive by Angola's diamond and oil wealth, continued until it was brought to a sudden end by the death of Savimbi in 2002. This enabled the MPLA to claim a decisive victory, not achieved by foreign arms or the result of an internationally negotiated peace settlement. As this coincided with a boom in oil revenues, MPLA had a unique opportunity to embark on a nation building project without any dependence on foreign aid or any international conditionality. The UN, UN intervention in Mozambique was better resourced and much more attention was given to demobilization and resettlement before any elections were held. And there was effective international involvement by neighboring African countries and by the international community, notably Italy. The ceasefire was followed by two years when the United Nations effectively ruled the country. Eventually, elections were held in 1994, and Mozambique began a period of uneasy peace under its uh, first democratically elected Frelimo government. Mozambique's situation was very different from that of Angola. There had been no decisive military victory, and Mozambique had few marketable resources 
which made it totally dependent on foreign aid. However, although the UN had invested a great deal in creating political structures, a, a liberal constitution, and civil society institutions, the peace accord turned out in the end to be seriously flawed. Although Filimo had jettisoned its socialist constitution, it was still dominated by the elite that had taken power in 1975, and its politics followed the logic of political patrimonialism. It adapted to the new international order, but with a determination that it and it alone would wield power in Mozambique. Significantly, there was little attempt to co-opt influential Renamo figures uh, or to bring any other opposition elements into the government. Moreover, the resettlement of former Renamo fighters remained an unres unresolved grievance. In spite of the influence of aid donors, Frelimo determined to act as far as possible like the MPLA, as though it had been victorious in the Civil War. The UN brokered constitution had not made any provision for power sharing. As a result, Frelimo was able to pursue a patrimonial political course which excluded large parts of the population. Although local and regular uh, sorry, local and national elections were held at regular intervals, Prolimo had little difficulty in securing electoral victories, partly by fraud, uh, but also through controlling every stage of the electoral process. Even so, opposition parties were able to secure control of some areas of local government, notably Beira, the second city, which for some time was controlled by the MDM, a party which had been founded in 2009. And here is an important point. Statistics from the UNDP Human Welfare Index, which measures life expectancy, education and per capita income, show that Mozambique remains one of the lowest rated countries in the world, number 185 out of 191. Although the socialization of the countryside had been abandoned, almost no effort was devoted to promoting peasant agriculture, although the peasant farmers of Mozambique constitute 85% of the population. And instead, Frelimo had concentrated on large capital projects to achieve modernization and economic development uh, in the same way that in the late colonial period, the colonial government had also uh, devoted all its resources to large capital projects. Um, uh, <coughs> um, similar to the uh, events that were taking place in Angola, the Frelimo government sought international partners uh, for large-scale developments, including the extraction of coal and natural gas, uh, and also the building of transport and other infrastructure projects. But these uh, investments were all carried out by a skilled foreign workforce, and their contribution to the development of Mozambique's own skills base was minimal. Moreover, Filimo adopted the policies of the former colonial government towards the dams on the Zambezi, plan planning to build a third dam in which would sell its uh, electricity to South Africa. These projects enable Filimo to present itself as a modernizing party, um, reflecting very much the modernity of the late colonial period. And all these cap major capital projects in Mozambique have resulted in forced relocations of the population, reminiscence again of the low colonial period. Frelimo had not devoted much attention to co-opting opposition elements or to reintegrating former Renamo soldiers. 
Instead, it sought to exclude Renamo from enjoying any of the dividends of peace. Starved of resources to reward its followers, Renamo could not operate an effective patrimonial politics. Renamo's response was to return to rural violence in the second decade of the uh, 21st century. This had the effect of forcing the government to negotiate a change in the constitution to uh, allow the direct election of provincial governors. Renamo had assumed this would allow it to gain influence. However, again, no formal power sharing agreement had been negotiated and Frelimo was able once again to control an electoral process where the winner takes all. The failure of this renegotiation and the death of Afonso de la Cama in 2018 led to the partial disintegration of Relimo as a political movement. And a similar pattern can be seen in the emergence of the Northern Insurrection. The government had paid little attention to the development of the North and had viewed it, to use the classic French phrase, as part of Afrique inutile. However, the sections of the population ignored by the pop patrimonial elite of Maputo were not ignored by Islam, which was able to exploit a wide range of grievances and sense of neglect, particularly among the younger generation. In Angola, since the end of the civil war in 2002, Angola was ruled by the victorious MPLA. The party and the state became one. UNITA had been decisively defeated, and for 20 years there was no serious challenge to MPLA, although elections were still held in order to maintain some internal and international legitimacy. However, although MPLA appeared to be dominant, the party did not exert any real control over the president, who was able to use the oil revenues to create his own parallel administration. While, and while using the country's wealth for his private purposes, Santos nevertheless took the trouble to bring important elements of the, uh, the party of civil society and even of the opposition onto his patrimonial payroll. Although elements of the UNITA leadership were co-opted co in this way, there was almost total neglect of public services for the population at large. The majority, the Afrique Inutile, was excluded from Santos's modernizing project. Um, the oil revenues of Angola and the fact that a military victory had been won decisively meant that Santos could proceed to the reconstruction of the country and the reinvention of Angolan nationality with any, without any significant outside moderating influence. As in Mozambique, modernization took the form of contracts with outsiders to carry out large capital projects. Many of them, some of them of great value, like the roads, rebuilding the road system, but others becoming useless white elephants with no serious long-term development. According to one commentator, there have been only a few thousand direct beneficiaries of this policy uh, surrounding an inner circle of only several hundred insiders, which include the professionals of violence, the leaders of the army, the police, and the intelligence services. Through its oil wealth, Angola was able to avoid the condition, conditionality attached to IMF and World Bank loans, and to, and to deal the, directly with China and with other bilateral partners. Now, how to understand what I have been describing? In his book, Africa Works, which appeared in 1999, Patrick Chabal questioned whether the international aspirations and projects for African development were in accord with the realities 
of African political culture. The relatively short colonial period in Africa had tried to bring Africa into line with the global economy. It had largely failed as the business model of capitalism, which the colonial powers employed, turned out to be purely exploitative. Nevertheless, at independence, it was assumed that Africans would follow, would attempt to follow a Western style development. This also proved an illusion, as Chabal pointed out, because the African ruling elites, although they sometimes paid lip service to Western values, in fact established regimes based on patrimonialism and rent seeking, which was more securely rooted in African culture. Shabal pointed out that Africa is not poor. It is extremely rich in resources. And the story since independence has been largely determined by what African elites have chosen to do with their resources, what their social and political priorities have been. Norway began to exploit its oil reserves at approximately the same time as Angola. And Norway has always ranked first or second in the world rankings of the Human Resources Index. There is no reason, apart from a difference in political culture, why Angola should not also rank among the first nations in the world in terms of human welfare. But in Angola and in Mozambique, policy has been determined by an elite which, since independence, has ruled with a scarce, scarcely disguised rent-seeking patrimonialism. That non-African countries should try to influence African domestic policies has been questioned, not only by major new oil uh, aid givers like India and China, but also by the large capital conglomerates that exploit Africa's resources. Why Western nations and Western research institutions um, should uh, continue to try to bring Africa into line with Western cultural ideals is no longer clear, let alone universally accepted. Perhaps the ruling elites of Africa should be allowed to run their own affairs according to their own cultural values and objectives. As a liberal westernizing projects of the last 150 years appear to have failed. This is not necessarily my point of view, but it is a very strongly held point of view in sections of the, uh, the international community. Even though the world is now faced by issues like climate change, money laundering, drug smuggling, pandemics, international intercontinental migrations, all of which recognize no frontiers and uh, cannot be isolated uh, one region from another. Those are my initial thoughts on the subject and I leave them with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Newitt. Uh, uh, uh,